I'm Maria Elena Giassi, and this is Currents. For over 40 years, Muammar Gaddafi ruled over the people of Libya. Today, his regime came to an end with his death. What does that mean for Libya and its Christians? Plus, it wasn't a clash of church and state at St. James Cathedral last night, but for once a year, harmony. We've got to be clear in our society that those who practice law and administer the law must be respected. And why is there evil in the world? We get the answer from a caped crusader and a joker. God allows evil because we need to make choices in order to build who we are and our character. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Matt McCoy has the night off. Amid conflicting reports that bounced around for much of the day today, one thing became certain. Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi is dead. Gaddafi, who ruled over Libya with an iron fist for over four decades, had been on the run since February when he was ousted from office by a rebel uprising. Libyans took to the streets in celebration after hearing of Gaddafi's death. Civilians and rebel fighters joined together, waving flags, honking horns, and cheering the news. In Washington, President Obama remembered some of the victims of Gaddafi's brutal regime. For us here in the United States, we are reminded today of all those Americans that we lost at the hands of Gaddafi's terror. Their families and friends are in our thoughts and in our prayers. We recall their bright smiles, their extraordinary lives, and their tragic deaths. The President also has a message for the Libyan people. You have won your revolution. The Vatican issued a statement saying that Gaddafi's death marked the end of a regime that was, quote, based on power instead of human dignity. And the Apostolic Nuncio de Malta and Libya also issued a statement today wishing the country a peaceful future in the wake of Gaddafi's death. But will peace come for Libya's already dwindling Christian minority community? Earlier today, our news director, Ed Wilkinson, talked to Ed Clancy of the Catholic charity Aid to the Church in Need, which assists persecuted Christians around the world. Ed Clancy, thanks for finding time to be with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, the big news of the day, of course, is the uh, death and the demise of uh, Muammar Gaddafi in uh, Libya. Uh, what effect might this have on what is really a small Christian community in Libya at this point? Well, I, I guess because Libya is, has been in turmoil you know, for, for quite a few months, um, many of the Christians have moved or left the area. Uh, but the big thing is to follow what has happened in Egypt, which uh, is to say that there is an opportunity for the Christian community to have rights for the first time. Mm -hmm. Because for 40 years, the Libyan government has had no constitution. Mm -hmm. So there is no written law that guaranteed them any, any religious freedom. Well, the Vatican statement uh, after the, the uh, death of Gaddafi says that it refers to him as, a, as an oppressive regime. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church, Christian Church was really uh, oppressed uh, on, yeah, under they, him. They, they were brutalized. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, in, I, I forget which year, I guess it was in the 90s when he made a statement about uh, there being only one faith. Mm -hmm. And um, he wasn't afraid to use violence to get to you know, his goals. Mm -hmm. What do you know about the state of the, of the uh, Christians there now? I mean, how many, there were, at one time there were four dioceses in Libya, yes. and uh, what's, the, what's the status, what's their status at this point? Well, there's, there are f four dioceses, you know, uh, named in Libya. Two of the dioceses have, you know, don't have bishops at the current time. Uh, Libya, because it's a very arid country, most of the population is on the northern coast. Uh, Tripoli has something like 85 to 90 percent of the population, and that's where almost all of the Christians are, um, they reside. Uh, at one time, it was about 3.1% of the population were Christians. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know now because uh, Gaddafi was never a man to release information or to you know, do a census for the purposes of truth. It was more mm -hmm. to just to serve his means and his, um, mm -hmm. his ends. Well, was there a functioning church there, though, in recent years? There, there is a functioning church, yes. Mm -hmm. It is not functioning in the way that it functions here. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are Catholic priests there. There are people who are Christian in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so. uh, an article that I read this morning said there were very few Christians left 
uh, in Libya at this point because a lot of them had left the country when the revolution came along because of the uncertainty of things. Uh, uh, how do you assess that situation? I, I, I would say that's very accurate. Well, where have they gone? Um, they probably have emigrated or you know, um, left to places like Egypt because they share uh, the eastern border of uh, Libya is Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, there's also you know, places like Chad, but there's very, very, very high uh, poverty rate in Chad, so there wouldn't be much hope there. Mm -hmm. um, and then Tunisia was another place that borders uh, Libya. Mm -hmm. But again, because of the uprising there, that's not a very safe place to go. So Right. Well, there was great, I mean, it's amazing that you would say they went to Egypt because, yeah. uh, again, the churches there have been uh, are being persecuted. Some churches were being uh, burned and looted mm -hmm. in recent weeks. And, uh, you know, there was great hope for the Christian community when the uh, uprising, the popular revolution came in Egypt. That seems to have waned at this point. What's likely to happen in Libya? Do you think there's more hope now for the Christian community? Um, it's a very tough question because uh, the case in Egypt is a perfect example of what can happen when there is new freedom. Um, organized minorities can take power, like the Islamic Brotherhood may take power in Egypt. Um, and the same thing might happen in, in Libya. And if that does happen and you get a state that's you know, can be as bad as it is in Iran, where essentially mm -hmm. you can't be Christian. Yeah. Uh, another thing to re remember is that there was a, a, a very close relationship with Italy for many years, for half of a, of a century. Uh, so some of the, at the beginning of the, the revolution, some people were trying to go to uh, Italy, mm -hmm. and there was some, you know, some emigres went to Italy also. Yeah. But, you know, as far as the people who needed to move, they probably went to places like Egypt. In our final, uh, <coughs> our final minute here, would you tell us a little bit about your group, Aid to the Church in Need, and what you do? Sure. Aid to the Church in Need has, for over 60 years, supported the persecuted and suffering church around the world. Um, we've supported the church in um, places like Egypt and in Libya to a very small extent, mainly because there's, you know, it's been very difficult under Gaddafi to have any semblance of organization. Uh, but we support the church everywhere in the world in every single one of the continents and have projects you know, in about 100 countries a year. Mm -hmm. And if people want to get in touch with you, do you have a website they can go to? Yes, we do. You can go to churchinneed.org, or you can call us at 1-800-628-NEED, or 628-6333, mm -hmm. and you can get some information. Uh, we do a book called Persecuted and Forgotten. That's a, a possible um, option. And it's based right here in Brooklyn. Yes, it is. Great. And Thanks so much for is. taking the time and coming to explain the situation with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Okay. Stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. Clashes in Egypt bring Coptic Christians to Washington. We'll have that story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Maria Elena Giassi. Coming up later, a lesson in evil, courtesy of a caped crusader. First, let's look at, have a look at today's headlines. Coptic Christians in the U.S. converged on the White House Wednesday to protest the rising violence against e Egypt's minority Christian community. Their demand? That the Obama administration pressure the Egyptian government to protect the rights of Christians. The Washington Post reports Hundreds of Copts traveled from as far away as New York and Chicago to take part in the protest. Many held up photos of crushed bodies they say were deliberately run over by Egyptian army tanks in Cairo last week, when at least 25 Egyptian Christians were killed in the latest clash. Meanwhile, advocates from different faith communities are urging Congress to continue funding the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Writing in National Review Online, a commission member cited the agency's critical advocacy for religious minorities in Sudan, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. The House voted overwhelmingly to approve funding for the commission last month, but Catholic News Agency is reporting that an unidentified senator has put a hold on the bill. The head of the Maronite Catholic Church has made his inaugural visit to the U.S. from Lebanon. Earlier today, he spoke with reporters about the impact of the Arab Spring on the region's Christians. Shortly after his arrival in New York City, his beatitude, Bishara Peter Rai, spoke with members of the press about the need to adopt an attitude of tolerance in the Middle East, 
and about concerns facing Lebanon. I ask the world community to commit itself to implementing the UN resolutions concerning Lebanon in a direct way, which requires Israel to withdraw and to refrain from violating Lebanese sovereignty. Likewise, Resolution 194, which guarantees the half a million Palestinian refugees in Lebanon the right of return. He also touched on the radical changes which have swept through the political landscapes of Egypt, Libya, and other countries in that region, and expressed cautious optimism. The so-called Arab Spring holds much promise, yet we must remain vigilant. The Church abhors the use of violence to meet any goal. After his address, he took questions and spoke in Arabic, translated into English. Many of the questions centered around the violence toward Christians in the region, particularly Egypt. There's no justification whatsoever for uh, Muslims to persecute those Christians or to hate them because they done, haven't done anything to harm anybody. As Meronite Patriarch, I would like to add, the Meronites have always in history been bridge builders. I hope that this visit has built yet a small bridge for the good of the United States of America and for Lebanon. Thank you. The Maronite Patriarch will be in Brooklyn through the weekend. He is scheduled to celebrate Mass at Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Cathedral in Brooklyn Heights this Sunday. In response to what is being branded Islamophobic propaganda since 9-11, Muslim scholars in the U.S. have issued a ruling or fatwa that being a faithful Muslim and a loyal American is not contradictory. In the resolution on being faithful Muslims and loyal Americans, Scholars say that Islamic teaching requires Muslims to respect the laws in places where they are a minority, as long as there is no conflict between the law and their obedience to God. Muslims make up less than 1% of the U.S. population. New York Archbishop Timothy Dolan has welcomed news of the appointment of the new Apostolic Nuncio to the U.S. Yesterday, the Pope named Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano to the post. In a letter, Dolan offered Vigano the prayerful support of his brother bishops. Vigano succeeds Archbishop Pietro Sambi, who died in July after complications from surgery. And Archbishop Dolan is also expressing gratitude for a New York Daily News editorial on actress Susan Sarandon. Over the weekend, during a panel at the Hamptons Film Festival, Sarandon, who played a Catholic nun in Dead Man Walking, said she sent a copy of the book the movie is based upon to the Pope. The actress went on to clarify which pope, saying the last one, not this Nazi one we have now. The Daily News editorial said Sarandon defamed Pope Benedict and used a grotesque characterization. Meanwhile, a group of European rabbis is calling on Pope Benedict to condemn the latest remarks of a controversial Catholic bishop and put an end to reconciliation talks with his group. In the latest issue of his newsletter, Bishop Richard Williamson, a member of the ultra-traditionalist splinter group, Society of St. Pius X, blamed Jews for deicide, or the death of Jesus. Back in 2009, Pope Benedict lifted the excommunication of Williamson, but shortly after that, it was revealed that Williamson had publicly denied the Holocaust, a position the Pope was not aware of when he lifted the excommunication. From Italy, it's news the leader of Opus Dei says is not even worth commenting on. According to reports, an Italian basketball team is in talks for a sponsorship deal with a website that helps married people cheat on their spouses. The team reportedly hopes to use the money from the sponsorship to court Andrea Bargnani, an Italian basketball star currently playing for the NBA's Toronto Raptors. Opus Dei head Monsignor Fabio Capucci told the Italian news agency ANSA that the potential sponsorship is a betrayal of values and even of the identity of the sport. 
When U.S. bishops gather in Baltimore next month for their regular fall meetings, one item on the agenda will be to decide on whether to add a memorial to Blessed John Paul II to the Church's liturgical calendar. Pope Benedict beatified John Paul in May of this year. Beatification does not automatically add a person to the calendar of the worldwide church. It is a decision left to the bishops of each country. At the invitation of Pope Benedict, the leaders of the world's faith will gather at Assisi next week, and they may want to pack a pair of boots, tall boots. Rome Reports has details. The Italian town of Assisi has long been a magnet for tourists and religious pilgrims. However, they may be surprised to learn that the town is said to be sinking. According to the European Space Agency, the small town in central Italy is in fact sinking at a rate of 7.5 millimeters every year. New satellite images show changes in the Earth that can measure ground movement down to a scale of a few millimeters. If a Zizi continues to lose ground at its current rate, it means that in 100 years, close to 30 inches of the city will be underground. Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead. Coming up, men and women of the legal profession come together for a special blessing. Today we ask the inspiration of the Holy Spirit upon everyone here that you might make the right decisions in conformity with God's law and with the law of man. Welcome back. It's a tradition that dates back centuries and takes place around the world. It is the Red Mass, celebrated annually for judges, attorneys, other legal professionals, and government officials. The Mass gets its name from the red vestments worn by the priest as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. In Washington, their celebration, which takes place annually on the Sunday before the first Monday of October, usually attracts some pretty big names. This year, six of the nine Supreme Court justices, along with members of the Obama administration, including Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, were in attendance. Last night, though, it was the Diocese of Brooklyn's turn to pray for the men and women who hold the balance of justice in their hands every day. Today we ask the inspiration of the Holy Spirit upon everyone here, those who are attorneys, those who are judges, that you might make the right decisions in conformity with God's law and with the law of man. Tonight we're coming for the annual Red Mass. This is a Mass that be, as at the beginning of the uh, judicial year. We pray for the God's blessing and the light of the Holy Spirit upon our lawyers and judges, and we have the Catholic Lawyers Guild plus the Colombian Lawyers will sponsor this Mass. This Mass goes back basically to the Middle Ages when uh, at the beginning of the court year, uh, the Archbishop or the Bishop of the place would gather the lawyers together, the judges, and seek God's blessing upon their work so that they will come to good judgments and decisions. The red color has to do with the Mass of the Holy Spirit, which is the traditional color we, may, uh, we would uh, use for the Mass of the Holy Spirit. It's, it is the Mass of the Holy Spirit that's, that is uh, uh, celebrated. Although the laws do recognize the freedom of individual conscience and individuals, it seems to be much more difficult to recognize the rights of institutions to have a conscience. The message tonight will really speak about how the, the church really is involved in uh, society, how the church and state relationship is critical to the application of the law that protects conscience. And that's the whole thing that we were speaking about is conscience that is at the basis of all things. We oppose artificial contraception and sterilization and we see that during this period of applying the new health law, we might be forced to provide for what we do not believe is moral. These are just some of the current issues I think we're feeling when we talk about separation of church and state. Our judiciary is, is uh, guided by principles of both law uh, and, and, um, and natural law. And uh, with the invocation of common sense, uh, we, can, we can truly find a, a 
balance uh, and, uh, and an administration of justice and fairness for all. Your faith is a part of you, and always with your work, you want to try and do the right thing. So you can't separate that. Um, and there are times when it does become, uh, you know, something that gives you a lot of thought. But in the end, you always, you always go by what you think is right, and that helps you with your work. We've got to be clear in our society that those who practice law and minister the law must be respected. And hopefully tonight, we can add to that respect that respect that comes from your position in society and your position before God. You have that responsibility of guarding human laws, while it is the church's responsibility to, law, to guard the law of God. Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead. When we return, a church hosts a film festival on a spooky topic. The forces of evil. I think that as a Catholic person, we're always faced with the choice to do things the right way or to do things the wrong way. Finally tonight, it is a movie that is arguably best known as the second to last movie role of the now deceased actor Heath Ledger. Ledger's haunting portrayal of Batman's nemesis, the Joker, in 2008's The Dark Knight won him an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. But the film is so much more than one actor's performance, no matter how brilliant. With villains like the Joker and Two-Face, The Dark Knight is also an opportunity to shed light on the nature of evil. And enlightening the curious on the various faces of evil is exactly the goal of The Force of Evil, the three-week film festival happening at Immaculate Conception Parish in Astoria. Well, we, this film festival uh, is um, conceived around the, the uh, investigation of what evil is or is not. Today's film, uh, The Dark Knight, speaks uh, about the issue of personal choice that can be evil. I could have given a lecture on it, but it's not the same thing as seeing this and then seeing the issues actually worked out and lived out in film. I think it's interesting. I mean, it, it's, I mean, there's a sense of community here. Um, you know, we have people of all ages coming to see these films, have a chance to hear like a theological point perspective on the film, which is very interesting. Evil can destroy lives, can destroy families, can destroy uh, even nations. As believing Christians, we need to try to understand and perceive what this thing is that we call evil. Oh, I think that as a Catholic person, we're always faced with the choice to do things the right way or to do things the wrong way. And I think that we have to do things the right way, uh, the way that we've been taught, that we know is right, regardless of the difficulty of it, regardless of how it would be easier sometimes to, to go the other way. I think we all struggle with good and evil. I think what happened to Harvey Dent, the DA in this uh, film, um, is a struggle within him between uh, the need for justice and the need for revenge. You know, what is justice and morality? Like, how do we put this in our own hands? Just like as we were watching The Dark Knight, I mean, the police, they had all of these opportunities to kill the Joker and put an end to him so he didn't, you know, kill anymore throughout the movie. But when it came down to it, they chose justice over that and putting that in the hands of the law. I think God allows evil because we need to make choices in order to build who we are and our character. And so we need to grow in strength and in goodness. And in order for us to do that, we have to have choices. And in order for us to, be to have choices, we have to be able to choose good versus evil. Can you use evil to fight evil? And this sounds like a very uh, strange thing, but it permeates the film. I was consistently impressed with how the film portrayed the disappointment of the Joker when people did not go along with his plans, with the evil of his plans, and how he was consistently let down, but in reality, it, was as it showed how good people could truly be. I hope people realize that evil is a force to be reckoned with, that it exists in their own lives and in their families, and that they need to combat the forces of evil with good and, and not with evil. 
And don't worry, you haven't missed a thing. The film festival is still going strong. Tomorrow night, Immaculate Conception will be screening Never Let Me Go and discussing institutional evil. That is all for this edition of Currents. Coming up tomorrow night, during this Respect Life Month, we go into the deep with Bishop DiMarzio on a life issue with a twist and get a Catholic perspective on the death penalty. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Maria Elena Giassi. Thank you for watching and have a great night.